All right, welcome everyone to um, virtual gatherings for small congregations. Um, I'm Phil Lund from the Mid-America region, and this is um, what has turned out perhaps to be part of a series of webinars that we have, um, are putting together for leaders or interested people in any of our congregations. Um, and this one is clearly uh, for small congregations. And um, yeah. I'm glad there are so many people here. I'm uh, happy to see you all. And uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier before we started, I want you all to know this, is we probably are going to do these Thursday night webinars um, at least through April, April, and they will feature some content for small congregations. Um, we're thinking about some about religious education, pastoral care, uh, maybe some more of these, um, maybe we could go deeper into Zoom on one of those um, webinars. So um, just remember that you'll see, we'll, we'll promote those and advertise those the way we have been uh, with these so far. But um, if you're around on Thursday evenings and you're in a small congregation and you want to check out what's happening, we will be doing more of these in the future. Okay, so you got my first tip there. My second tip we already did, when you're the host of a meeting on the participants list, you can mute everybody. And generally that's a good thing to do because um, you, get, you can get a lot of uh, background noise going on. Um, pets, dogs, um, dishwashers, all sorts of stuff. So um, it's good to mute everybody right off the bat. Now, you all can unmute yourself. Um, um, I think the best way to find that is if you hover over the picture of yourself with your cursor, you should get something that says unmute, and that's how you can unmute yourself. So you can all unmute yourself individually. And that's important too. Uh, let's say we're doing worship and you might have two or three people doing worship with you. They all know uh, um, how to um, unmute themselves, of course, because you've kind of uh, rehearsed it. And um, you might want to do joys and concerns still, though, so people can unmute themselves and speak. Um, oh, I have a little something in the chat. It's a question, what constitutes a small congregation? That is a good question. I think a lot of things, um, the truth is, uh, for a large denomination, uh, 350 is a small congregation to them still. Um, when we talk about small congregations, Unitarian Universalism, I think the line is somewhere between where a congregation is likely to have a full-time clergy person and where they're likely to have less than full-time or no clergy people. And to be honest with you, that's around 100 to 120 where we start to see that happen. There aren't a whole lot of congregations smaller than 100 that have full-time clergy. I, only, I know of only a couple of them. And then by the time you get over 120, you start to see more and more and more congregations have full-time clergy. So, um, and depending on what region you're in, I think matters too. So this, um, this recent uh, year of learning that we did for small congregations where we had webinars and ended on Pi Day, and uh, we, we just picked 120 as the number, as our cutoff number. But when I look at, say, the Mid-America region, there's just some interesting things like um, there are about 75 congregations that have 80 members or fewer. So that could be a group. Or there's you know, maybe around 100 that have you know, 90 or 100 members. So that could be a cutoff. So um, the definition, I think, varies a little bit. But I think the one, around 120 might be a good one to look at. And another thing to look at, too, is, it, is uh, the content that say we're sharing primarily for um, lay leaders. And in this case, it is. Um, so, so that's when I think of small congregations, I, I generally do think of lay-led congregations. And of course, clergy people can learn from what we're doing too. But um, Oh, uh, yes, no reason, uh, yes, it doesn't matter if you are or not in a small congregation now, because we welcome everyone, so um, I'm glad you're all here. Okay, so um, the muting thing, that was a good tip right there. So I was thinking today, what I wanted to show you first 
um, was um, we're talking about Zoom primarily on this meeting. There are other ways to do this stuff, Google Hangouts, and I think you can do multiple meetings with Skype. And um, But it's really turned out for the UUA and a lot of congregations and a lot of organizations, Zoom has been the um, platform that people have really gravitated to. And they keep adding functions. We've been using it for a while, and they keep adding really, really good functions to this. And we'll talk about what some of those are. But uh, what I want to show you right now, um, let me see here, just get my screen up, yeah. What I want to show you is um, when, you, when you first set up Zoom, what some of your priorities should be, okay? So give me a second here. There we go. Okay. So what I want to do here is share my screen. And that's one of the functions you have. And I'm going to tell you something very important about screen sharing in just a moment. But so you share your screen. Um, that's something that you get to do as a host. And you can also turn it over to other people. But I'll tell you something about else about that in a moment, too. Okay, so here we are sharing the screen. You all can see the my um, Zoom um, account. This is my Zoom account. This is the uh, when you log in, you can go to this, um, and you can go to your account when you um, open it up. And the part we want to look at is settings over here on the left bar okay i think there's some important settings to do with your zoom account right off the bat all right and like i said some of them i just found out about today some of them i just um i've known for a little while but so it comes set like so many things it has preset settings um, and you have to go in and change a few things to get the functionality that you need and they have basic in meeting settings and advanced in meeting settings. I just want to scroll down and show you a couple of these, okay? This join before host right here, um, that I think is, is automatically set for you when you have a Zoom account. Um, what's important about the join before host setting is that it does what obviously is if people, when I logged on here at 6.30, there were already 10 people logged on, okay? And so what we've been hearing from congregations already, smaller congregations who haven't worked with this before, they were just wondering how they could like set up a meeting for some people and not have to be there, right? How a, how a host could set up a meeting, but they necessarily wouldn't necessarily have to be there. Um, and you can always do that by having this join before host setting. Okay, so if people show up and you're not there, they can talk to each other, they can do whatever they need to do. They don't get the functions like being able to record or mute everybody, but let's say you wanna set up a meeting for a small group in your church, uh, to a, a small committee meeting or something like that, um, and you are the person who does the scheduling, which is another thing I recommend is that you have only one person do the scheduling. Um, so it goes through someone and they can keep track of the calendar. It's like, you know, the facilities, right? You have to have somebody sort of make sure you're not overlapping or so have one person be the scheduler. And that would be the person who has the password and everything to get into the, into the, um, zoom account. And that person is the host technically. And if you don't have this join before host set up, that person needs to be there for the meeting to go on. But if it's just a meeting for people to talk, three or four people to talk or something like that, to do some planning, and it doesn't need to be recorded and you don't need all those functions, they can do that without the host being there if you do the join before host, okay? Um, scrolling down, nothing too 
these have been turned off mute entry participant uh, mute participants upon entry I muted you all separately if you're going if you're going to be doing let's say Sunday morning worship and you're thinking you're going to get a fair amount of people there um, and you don't want all that extraneous noise happening right off the bat you can turn this one on and that does exactly what it says everybody will be muted when they show up so what we do at the UUA, we have um, lots of meetings, as I mentioned, on Zoom. And um, they've taken uh, headquarters to start having music playing at the beginning. And their computer is the only computer that's on that you can hear. So they mute it. Everybody's automatically muted before they, they enter. OK? So that's a good one to do, too. Now, um, let me see. We found the chat, private chat. Auto save, feedback to Zoom, co hosting. I'll just point this out. This is an important thing. You can add co hosts in the middle of a meeting. I can make any one of you a co host right now. And um, that's going to be important for something that I'm going to show you in a moment. But it also um, allows the co hosts, I believe, to have some of those functions like um, muting everyone and things like that. So so it's good to have a co-host um, if you're going to be doing a meeting where you need a lot of the functions of Zoom, like recording, like doing breakout rooms, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. So you have the capability of doing co-hosts. Let me just check the chat here, see if I have a few questions. Um, let me see. Yeah, there are some sales right now in Zoom. Uh, for Zoom, so keep an eye out for them. That's great. Yeah. And uh, I actually did uh, get mine through the UUMA. Um, the UUA gives um, staff Zoom accounts, but UUMA for ministers, you, you know, the UU Ministers Association had discounts for individuals, and that's the, the plan I got. So keep, you know, look around out there and see what kind of deals there are. And I might, I can share a deal with you too. If you need more than one host, there's a deal going on. That's good. Okay, here is the one I really wanted to show you, screen sharing, okay? I'm gonna to switch to something here. It's called Beware of Zoom Bombing, Screen Sharing Filth to Video Calls, okay? This is something that has happened since everybody was going to Zoom for their church, church services and stuff like that. Um, this happened at a web, at a, uh, at a uh, uh, online hangout called uh, WFH Happy Hour, a popular daily public Zoom call hosted by Verge reporter Casey Newton and investor Hunter Walk. What happened is somebody jumped on and they started um, sharing their screen with pornography and violent um, images. And they would kick that person off, but they would just re-enter and do it again and do it again and do it again okay and so you can imagine if you're doing a worship service and somebody wants to do that that could be very upsetting so what you can do with zoom and i got to get back to my zoom account here i'm sorry i managed to get myself out of it what you what you can do with zoom is turn that setting off Okay. Let me see here. Am I? I'm going to go to my, my account again, get back to the setting stuff. You can turn that off. I did not know about that until I read that article. And I think that's super important. Um, because, you know, if we're doing worship and we're, we're, we're publicizing that we're doing worship and anybody can show up, we really don't want anybody to be able to share their screen. Right. We want that just to be something that the hosts and the co-hosts can do. So go to settings and then go to, um, go to settings and then go to in meeting basic or just keep scrolling down like I did. And you will get to this setting that says screen sharing and change it to host only, okay? Because you really want to avoid that. You don't want people to just show up and then start sharing their screen indiscriminately. So that's one of the things I just learned in the last couple of days about Zoom. So I really want to emphasize that. Okay. 
Um, a lot of more, a lot more of these settings that were all already there when we, um, when I opened up my account, I didn't have to change anything. Um, breakout rooms. This is something you might want to do if you're having a virtual coffee hour or something like this, or if you're just having a, a check in with folks and you have a question like um, a kind of a, you know, a, how are they doing about you know, self-isolation or whatever, and you might want to ask them, you know, what's one good thing that has happened because of this and what's one not so good thing, but you've got 20 people, you can break them up into breakout rooms. And um, you can either have this where the host gets to do the splitting um, ahead of time or not. Now, I've always done this randomly. I haven't decided who's with whom. Um, and I think for the most part, that's what we can do if we're like having a check-in with our congregants or whatever. We might just, you know, mix it up and just automatically go into breakout room. But the, the settings are um, adaptable for that, so. Yeah, somebody's asking about sharing their account with uh, anyone else in the congregation. That is what Zoom's rules are. That's, you know, when you get the account, you're agreeing to do that. So the way, like I said, you can um, schedule a meeting on your account. You can be the host, but you can allow people to join before the host is there and they can participate. So that's why I'm saying it's good to just have one person in your congregation be the scheduler and be the host because then you're staying within your terms of agreement there. But the host doesn't always have to be at the meeting. That's the difference. And, you know, if a host could show up and start the meeting and then just let everybody else, you know, do what they're going to be doing. But, okay. Um, yes, uh, some of these functions, you're asking about functionality, they may only come with a paid account. That's something we would need to um, look at there. And you can initiate breakouts um, in from the um, from the control panel you have as the host. There's a, something you can click on that says breakout rooms, and it lets you do that. We might try that out if we have some time. Um, okay, so uh, paid accounts do have this breakout room functionality, and I should tell you, you know, the difference between a free account and a paid account is a free account. Um, limits you to 40 minutes, four zero, uh, for multiple people. Whereas the paid accounts have 100, 300, 500, depending on what license you have for it. All right, just gonna check the chat here, a couple more things. Yes, um, there is closed caption too, and we'll talk about that. All right. Oh, and Barb, yeah, Barb's mentioning if somebody doesn't uh, show up as the host, um, Zoom will drop. Yeah, I haven't experienced that, but that might be true. I think we can just see if that's something what's happen what happens as we, as we keep working on this. But, all right, so um, closed captioning, yes. I guess I'll tell you about that right now. They do have closed captioning on the paid account. That's something you would set up as the host. The way it works, though, is somebody has to be typing the closed captioning as it's going. It's not automatic. It's not artificial intelligence or anything like that. Um, that might work if somebody has a message, uh, a, a homily, a sermon, or something like that, and a script. And I could see somebody you know, cutting and pasting the script in. Um, but it does read on the bottom like a closed caption um, thing, a teleprompter kind of thing. So yes, it is available. Um, and we would need to, you know, we would need to figure out how to do this. Um, I could see doing it in a worship service. The, the host is able to assign the closed captioning to somebody, and then that person is just typing in what they're hearing as it's going along. So you would need somebody who's a pretty fast typer. But, you know, it's a role that somebody could play. So yes, closed captioning available. Um, let's see here. And there was one other thing I wanted to show you. Yes. Show a join from your browser link. That you need to turn on in your um, settings. And it's right there. Okay. And the reason you need to turn that on is Zoom says, you know, they want people to download the platform. 
And if that's not on there, people absolutely have to download the platform in order to attend. And for some folks, um, either they don't want to download new applications onto their computer or just the just talking about downloading an app might make them feel like this is just too complex. So you can have it so a join from your browser link shows up on Zoom and then they don't need to um, download the platform in order to participate. And I think for some folks that might make a difference. So that's one I really wanted to show you there. And that, that really just is something that um, today um, I, I, I came across by talking with somebody at one of our congregations. Uh, they were trying to um, do a little Zoom uh, uh, tutorial. And as they were going through it, somebody thought this was just too complicated and they dropped out of the call. And I'm thinking, you know, if we can, the easier we can make it for people to participate, the better. And so actually, this, for me, this is kind of the third um, option for making things easy for folks. Um, to, to me, the super easy thing is join from the computer, join the audio. You get that choice when you show up, you know, and you've got your earbuds and everything and you're ready to go. Um, but you know, you have that phone in option too. And uh, for some folks, that might be the only thing they can do. And that's another thing that's less complex than asking people to be on the computer and downloading everything is to just do the phone in option. So that might uh, help some people participate. Okay. Um, and I want to just say when you when if when you're really kind of uh, encouraging the phone in option. Um, it kind of changes the way that you're doing your meeting, your worship or whatever it is, because somebody is there who is essentially visually impaired because they can't see what you're doing on the screen. So think about what you're doing in a way that if somebody can't see what you're doing, they can still participate, okay? So that might be, um, you know, you might've made a ni nice, um, you made of my, you, um, you uh, might have made a nice video, you made, it, made, it, made a, a nice uh, image to project for people to look at, you know, that's great. But you would need, knowing that you had some people there who um, couldn't see it, you would need to describe it then, you know. Um, so just think about that, all right? Because we want to we wanna make this as easy for people to participate as possible. So the third thing then is this join from your browser link. For those people who just don't want to download a new app, having that link on there will make things easier for them to do it. Now that browser only uh, screen that they get doesn't have all the functionality of downloading Zoom. But I think for somebody to watch a worship service or attend a meeting you know, and just participate by speaking, um, I think that will give them everything they need. Um, so those are the things I really th think it's worth taking a look at on your settings page and doing, okay? All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment. I'm gonna check the chat because we had um, some comments here. Let me just see where we are with those and see if we can talk about anything here. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how many um, breakout rooms are possible. Um, I've been in classes of up to 100 people, and they've done breakout rooms where we got into groups of four. So, you know, you can do a lot, you can do a lot of breakout rooms then. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I'm going to close captioning. I'm not sure what the waiting room is. We'll look into that more. Uh, um, yes, you can put a link of the meeting on the web page for people to just click on it. It would take them to the Zoom website, and then it would say download the app by clicking here. But if you make sure you have that join by browser thing on that too, they would have that option as well. And it's just one link that you need to do that on. Um, oh, yeah. So. Answer about the waiting room. Thank you, Lynn. The waiting room is available if you set the meeting 
to not allow participants to join before the host. So they get a message that they are in the waiting room and they're waiting for the host to let them in. Okay. Um, yes. And what is the allow live streaming meetings? Yes. Um, we're not going to go into this today, but you can link up your Zoom with both YouTube or Facebook and use their live streaming ability. Okay. And for some folks, that's, that's another way to make it easier. You know, is like rather than going to Zoom and having to download the app and everything, if you're in Facebook, you can just watch it on Facebook. So a lot of congregations stream their um, worship services on Facebook along with whatever other way they're doing it. But we're not going to go into that tonight, but it is um, something that you can do. And uh, Jim had an answer about breakout rooms, 50 breakout rooms. Um, thank you. Um, Question about copyright for music. Um, we're not gonna go into that too much tonight, but it's one of the resources um, that you can find on the page that I'm going to go to. Um, actually, too, I just got an email from the Association of UU Music Ministries and several of the composers who've written songs that are in both the Gray Hymnal and the Teal Hymnal have given blanket permission for people to use them. Um, there is also a spreadsheet available that was done by the UU Church of Rockford where they track down who has the copyrights for um, all of the music in both hymnals. Um, and I can um, get that. I'm realizing now that, um, yeah, I'll tell you what, because, uh, because we did not have registration on here, I don't have your email addresses or anything like that. So what I'll need you to do, if you have a particular thing you want me to get to you, send me an email at plund at uua.org. I'll put that up here, put it in the chat. Send me an email about the particular thing you're interested in and I will try to get you hooked up with the resources you need, okay? Um, and that's one of them. That's a good question about the copyright, and I can try to get you more information about that. And um, we also can um, let you know if there's other webinars and things like that happening around that too. Okay, so here we go. Yep, there's my email address. Okay, so um, I'm happy to uh, help you out with that. All right. Okay. Um, all right, so this is the part then, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. This is the resource I really wanted to um, show you. Sharing my screen. Um, this is on the UUA webpage, website. Um, it's guide to streaming Sunday services, meetings and classes, okay? And this is a uh, part of what they call the Leader Lab, the Leader Lab library that we have that has been put together by several of my colleagues. Um, they call it uh, tips, tools, and uh, um, tips, tools, and something else. I've got something blocking it. Tips, tools, and trainings for leaders. And because over the last couple of weeks, or over the last week, really, when it became clear that many, many, if not most of our congregations were moving to Sunday services being online um, and there are other meetings as well. They really just kind of went into overdrive and got a lot of resources for us up here. So what they're doing is calling this an ebook and that it's a worse work in progress. Um, let me get you the, I know I had the, um, the, um, the web address for this in the invitations to the uh, webinar, but I'm gonna put it in the chat again here so you can get it right there. So, so this is like the number one place to go when you're really just starting to think about or, or just starting to use Zoom. Maybe you, maybe you used it last um, Sunday and you just wanna you know, do a better job at it. Um, this is the place to go, okay? So the, the main articles that I think really work for us the best are one, the streaming Sunday services, technical tips. Um, 
and I've got some ideas about this that I'll, I'll share with you, but this is where you just go out to find the basics. They talk about Facebook Live, YouTube Live, YouTube Live and Zoom. And this particular webinar is focusing on Zoom. They list a couple other platforms that you might want to use. But the important thing is checklist for streaming your preparation. Um, determine how you're going to do it. Um, the important things is doing some test runs sometimes during the week, uh, making sure that everything works. Um, they recommend having somebody called a tech us usher, somebody who can help people out. Um, on Sunday morning, start the stream 15 minutes early. I showed up, that's always a good thing. I showed up 15 minutes early here because people show up and um, it's a chance to just make sure that everything's working on the connections and all, there aren't any issues. And on, I won't say oftentimes, but sometimes you run into issues. You've checked everything out and you still have um, things that you need to deal with. My cat wants out, there she goes. All right, so. Here's what I wanted to talk to you about, uh, the hardware setup and options. It's been my experience, and um, we could have a debate about this if you would like at some point, but I've done a lot of um, Sunday morning worships at, a, at small congregations. And I've, it's been my experience, I think that most of what we do on Sunday mornings for a smaller congregation can really be done in a Zoom room without having to do the kind of streaming where somebody's at a pulpit and the camera is further away and you have to get the audio all right and everything. I really envision what something a small congregation can do could be where everybody is in their um, own setting and that the participants in the um, worship service are kind of, um, uh, kind of, um, what's the word I want to use, shepherded by the host. So I don't think the host necessarily would have to be the person speaking, but that would, the host would be the person who would be muting and unmuting people so they could speak, okay? And those people can, don't need to be in the same room. For larger congregations doing uh, worships, worship online, from what I've seen is, you know, they might do it in their home, in their regular sanctuary, their regular setting, they have people sitting at least six feet apart, you know, for the for the social distancing um, requirements. Um, and they're using the pulpit, they're lighting their chalice, they're doing all of this stuff. Um, and it it becomes um, something that it's good to have, you know, um, some staff people and some really tech savvy volunteers available to help you do that. Um, if you're just going to do like what we're doing here. Uh, you don't need to do it in your church setting. The, whoever the presenter is can be at home um, waiting for the host to unmute them so they can present. Whoever's doing the announcements, whoever's doing the readings. So that's one thing that I really want you to consider is, is how are you going to be doing the um, Sunday morning worship? And as I said, I think we can break down most of the elements of what we do um, on Sunday morning um, into um, an experience that can be done like this. So I guess this would be a good time to just, if you haven't experienced it already, um, for me, it's in the upper um, right-hand corner where you can toggle between speaker view and gallery view. Okay, have you, have you seen that? You can go between speaker view and gallery view. And right now I've got a phone in the speaker view and not me. What I'm gonna do over here is pin my video. Am I now the person you see if you go to speaker view? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Yeah, so here's what I'm saying then is, you know, um, uh, on the average, I don't know, a small congregation, my experience, you might have three, or four people who are really going to be doing some sort of uh, thing uh, up at the front as part of the uh, worship experience. So, you know, you'll have somebody who, who maybe does a welcome and you might have somebody who does the chalice lighting and then you might have somebody introducing the speaker and then you have the speaker. 
So you can do that all by having this uh, speaker view set for the people um, in the uh, congregation, you all out in the audience. Audience, is that what we call them? In the congregation. So, um, so that's just something to consider. And then there are some other tips, we're not gonna go into them, but you know, what's your setting like? What's your backdrop? Are you in a place where you won't be disturbed, you know, when you're leading the worship service in some sort of way? So like I had my cat wanted to go out of the room, so I had to go open the door, you know? So, um, so you wanna try to reduce those kind of um, um, inconveniences, all right? So that's something to consider exactly how you wanna do that. Um, yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, Leticia Smith's asking about, is there a way to arrange the order in which participants appear on the screen so that it would be easier to find people in a larger meeting? No, but um, there's a couple things what you can do in terms of finding people is you can, when you're in the chat, you can scroll down and see everybody's name. Um, so if people have put their, their full name in there looking for somebody, you'll be able to find them in the chat. And also another thing you can do in the chat is to just do a private chat with specific people. So I've had a couple of people already here, they sent me private chat messages, and that's one of the functions that you have um, in a Zoom, okay? But yes, I've also often wondered that too. You know, we've had meetings with 100 people in it, and it's just like five screens that you roll, scroll through, and you just see all the faces that way. And it's really hard, difficult to single out a single uh, somebody. So, um, you know, I don't, Mark uh, is asking, is there a way to make a speaker view the default for people um, or do they have to do it themselves? It's been my experience. I think that they have to do it themselves. Yeah. Um, yes, it is possible to share recorded music. Um, I haven't done it yet. I, 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 um, I think what you do is you would, um, do your recorded music um, app or whatever it is you have on your computer. So if you have Spotify or whatever, what I've seen is people will have a Spotify set list and you can actually see what they're playing, but then everybody can hear the music that they're playing if they're the host or the co-host or something like that. Um, and then Barb is letting us know that this is, this is I was gonna get to the, another way to find people is if you hover over your, um, the part uh, participants, um, if you hover over your, hey Barb, do you wanna unmute and tell us, tell us about that? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, um, I'm on an iPad in the mm -hmm. upper right hand corner. There's um, a picture of some people and it says participants under it. Mm -hmm. If you open that up and then you click on your, na your own name, it gives you the option to raise hand, mute audio, or rename who you are. So that's that's where I found the raise hand. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and then we have a question too. Um, yeah, and, and uh, Lynn is telling us about how to find that too in the chat. And then a question about copyright protections against sharing recorded music. If you were just doing Zoom in your group, um, there's usually no problem with doing recorded music. When it gets to be a problem is when you stream it or record it and put it on a platform like YouTube. Um, YouTube will actually take down something that has copyrighted music on it that you don't have the copyright for. So that's, that's when you really get into difficulties there. Um, but I've seen plenty of places where people, um, yeah, with music, what are you saying? Yeah, with music, you have to play it with your, without your um, headsets or earbuds. Um, and, you know, people are asking, how, can, how do you delegate other, other hosts and things like that? Um, you know, that's uh, actually, you need, the, um, you need the host screen to do that sort of stuff. Um, and it is through the participants, thing um, if I yeah when I get the participant screen I get something that says more 
And if I click on the more thing, it allows me to make co-hosts, all right? And I was also gonna show you too, I was gonna rename myself and quit being, um, no, no, I wanna cancel that. I was about to rename one of you. I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna rename myself. There we go, Philip Blunt. So that's something that you can do too. Um, so if, um, yeah, so if, you know, your account says UU Church of whatever, and you wanna put your name in as the host, then you can do that, all right? Um, yes, and with the paid subscription, there is a good training video. There are very good training videos about how to doing a lot of this stuff. Um, and yes, somebody's asking about removing music when you edit it, yes, you can. Um, and you need another program to edit. So I have a, a Mac, and so I have iMovie, and oftentimes I'll use iMovie to edit my uh, webinars before I put them on. In fact, that's why I didn't, uh, that's why I canceled recording this one a couple times because I always end up having to edit out the, all the little stuff we do at the beginning. And I really just like to start recording when I'm ready to start the webinar. But you can edit the ending, the beginning, you can go in and cut snippets out and everything, but you do need editing software to do that. That's a good question. Okay. Um, so I wanted to get back to the um, streaming um, page. I really want to encourage you to just spend some time with this and um, just go through and take a look at some of these um, some of these uh, articles that they have, or, or chapters, actually. They're calling this a book, so these are chapters. Um, so Renee here has worship planning for online services. Um, and you know, just basic things like communicate the online location. So somebody asked earlier, can you just have the link to the Zoom room and put it on a website? Yes, you can. You can put it in an email. It can be clickable. That's all people need to get to your worship service, okay? Um, conserve your energy. If you have two or more services, you may wish to hold one at a later time. Record one for people who can't miss the live version. And then now she's talking about the copyrights uh, too. And so on this particular chapter called Worship Planning for Online Services, she has a whole section on knowing copyright rules. Okay, so I would encourage you to um, take a look at that. And this is where that spreadsheet with copyright information from uh, Matthew Johnson and the UU Church of Rockford, that's where it lives. If you click on that, you'll go to the spreadsheet. Oh, why don't I see if I can do it here. Go to the spreadsheet. Um, it downloads it for you, so I have to open it up. And I need to go to my sharing place and grab it someplace else. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Nope. Is that it? No. Ah, I don't do a lot of sharing. This is why we all need to practice whatever it is we're gonna do, right? Just keep practicing, keep practicing. Okay, here it is. So this is, um, this is Matthew's um, and Rockford's um, gift to us. They went and went through all the hymns and they just found out who has the copyrights for the words and the music, okay? And so what you're looking for are things in the public domain or things that have, have the UUA holds the copyright to or things that permission has been given for you use to use in some sort of way by crediting them or um, uh, or just permission to do that. The ideal thing is a public domain, public domain kind of thing. Words and music, public, do public domain. Those you can sing, have people play, all you want. Okay, not a problem with that. Um, like I said, I did get an email today from the Association of UU Music Ministries and several uh, composers have given people permission to use their um, their pieces 
on streaming, live, whatever it is. And so that's an, if you're interested in that, send me an email and I will send you a link to that um, email from the Association of UU Ministries. All right. Okay. So um, that was, I'll start sharing my screen again here. That was um, on the page from uh, Renee about planning worship services. So um, I really recommend that you go to that page from Renee and you take a look at um, all the explanations she has about the copyright rules. Um, learn the limits of technology. Um, how are you gonna get your best sound? Uh, what is singing like together? I think people find it difficult to sing as a group. I think what some people have been doing is have one person or a small group of people sing the hymn and, and, and have them be the one everybody sees on their screen because they're the one whose sound is on and then encourage people to just sing along at home but not try to get everybody's you know, audio together. And we talked about the closed captioning possibilities there too. Um, you can use various platforms to do online offerings. Um, you can click on to find out what some other congregations have done. Northland UU Church in Kirkland, Washington created the online worship service and they posted what they did. So you can find out more information about what they did. Um, here's a little talking about uh, breakout rooms and something about using stock videos for images. And remember I said, if somebody's on the phone and you have an image up, you're gonna to wanna to describe what the image is too, all right? Um, there's a couple of idiot, uh, videos people have had about practicing pref preference. And here's the thing about doing online uh, presence, practicing presence. And here's the thing about doing online um, offerings, okay? So that is, I think, a really great part of this. Um, there's a whole article on using copyrighted material to check out there. There's a couple articles on streaming to Facebook Live and streaming to YouTube Live. I, as I said, I don't think a smaller congregation needs to do this, but you certainly can. And we're not gonna go into this that tonight, but we could at a later webinar about how you actually do that, all right? Um, they also have a nice article on streaming to Zoom. That's covered a lot of what we're talking about. They do talk about how to live stream to Facebook or YouTube here. Um, they talk about setting up Zoom and they're talking about the breakout rooms um, here too, to allow breakout rooms. Um, so there's more information about that. And let me see, what were some of my favorites? Okay, um, so I'm gonna stop here for a moment because um, I think this was the number one thing for a lot of folks um, about using Zoom was how to use it for their worship service. Okay, I mean, that was kind of the real, um, the, uh, the, the thing that was giving us a lot of pressure last week was like, oh, we gotta suddenly get our worship services online and everything, and how are we gonna do that? And everybody gave it a good try. Now we've maybe got a little experience and we can do a little better. So um, that's what I've got for worship right now. And so I guess we'll just pause for a moment and see if we have any questions. I mean, we've gotten, been getting some questions about in the chat, but um, I would be happy to do that. Oh, what does the recorded session look like? Yeah, um, it gets stored either on the cloud or on your computer. It's a file. I think it's an MP4 file. And then I, I just do that onto um, iMovie, like I said, to edit it. But if it if it's, doesn't really need editing, you can just put those right up into Facebook or uh, right up into YouTube if you wanna put it somewhere like that. But I usually edit mine a little bit just to you know, take out a few things. Um, so um, I, let's, let's hear some other voices here. We heard Barb, we heard me, I've been talking a lot. I would be happy to hear some other folks if anyone has a question or a comment at this point. Um, I encourage you to jump in. Yeah, this is uh, Jim. Um, I'm in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Um, we're doing a rehearsal on Saturday, and I really encourage it because um, there are all these little glitches. Um, 
we were going to play some songs off of YouTube, and I had my earbuds in, and nobody could hear the song. You know, I have to. Uh, right. I had to un undo the earbuds and then um, play the song through my computer with everybody else muted. Yep. And, okay. Um, so there's, you know, rehearse, you rehearse, that. rehearse. That's you learned that. Way. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And um, doing it on Saturday, you know, why not? Um, we we did a book club session last. Uh, was it last night already? <laughs> Wednesday night. And uh, so that really worked. I think that idea of really rehearsing because you, you don't really know, like in the lighting, the lighting of the faces. So some of True. we started out with some people so dark that you can't really see their faces because the lighting is in back. So there's, that's one kind of practice. And then there's a cat who jumps around. So yep. you have to put your cat away. And you no, know, so, but I think the point about having whatever. You know, when you have your earphones, you know, it, it can interfere with the way in which the sounds are being heard. So anyway, yeah. so I, I uh, wholly endorse that idea of practicing before the, uh, the right. session. And, and really, maybe 15 minutes is not enough for, for hosting so that people can really have a chance to really get used to to being on Zoom, so you may want to allow for a half hour, especially if it's the first time. Yeah, you mean getting on a half hour earlier and really working with people, yeah. And about, thank you about the lighting, that's very important. Um, yeah, when I first started doing webinars in the evening, um, you know, it would be light out when it started and then it would just, it's been getting darker and darker and I've got a couple lights on in my room um, and I have another light that I didn't get out that's specifically for putting more light on. But what I've seen some people do, here's a tip, is they've made their own little uh, light diffuser box sort of thing by just taping a piece of paper over a light source. Not so it would catch on fire, but you know, if the light is too bright and you know, washing you out, they can you can make that light more diffuse by putting a piece of paper um kind of taped to the to the shade or whatever it is to kind of make it more diffuse so there are things you can do but yes lighting think about the lighting um uh diane yes i have a question i'm from um the unitarian universal church in bloomington normal illinois uh -huh. and uh i noticed that many times when people read they have their scripts down and you see the top of their head mm -hmm. which is not engaging for the congregation. Yeah, yeah. And so how do, what, what tips do you have? Do you, does like a um, music stand behind the, your computer screen, does that work or what do you do? I mean, you're yeah. just, you're just doing this off the top of your head so you don't have a script, but for the service, yeah. you're gonna have a script on Sunday. Yeah, so, um, so one thing I would suggest is um, you can still see me, right? Yeah. And I'm looking at something that I can read on my computer still. You know what I'm saying? So, so I, I just clicked on the thing that I wanted to read and it shows up on my computer and I'm looking right at it. Okay. okay. You can also get, um, you can download some teleprompter things that'll scroll words across the top and things like that. That's not, you know, I mean, there are things you can do like that. Um, let me see. Yeah, I, I have seen some presentations where the person who's presenting really goes way back. So that then even if you're reading, you can see the person. So, so, so that's one way, I think another way. So how did that work, uh, Leticia? So you actually, Pull yourself back from the screen. So oh, you pull yourself you, back from the screen and then but, you can. And, and then you can read, you can, you can yeah, show how you're yeah. lighting the chalice, you're dropping something, you know. Yeah. So, and I've done that way. Yes, and I've seen people standing up to do that too. I mean, we've been right. sitting a lot yeah. doing Zoom meetings all day, so I've been seeing people stand up for the meetings because they're just tired of sitting, right? Yeah. So you can mount your computer somewhere where you stand back a little ways um, and read from there and hold your text in front of you or whatever. Um, yeah, so there's lots of possibilities. Thank um, you, that's helpful. Thank yeah. you. Um, let me see. 
And then a question about hosting uh, coffee hours. That is a really good question. Any specific tips? The plan is uh, the host and to leave it open so people can drop in. You know what? I haven't experienced uh, online coffee hour yet. Uh, has anybody else done it uh, this week? Can we share anything about that? Uh, um, this is Cindy, Cindy, yes. Oh, sorry. I can't see when to jump in. That's good. Yeah, you're okay. Go ahead, Cindy. Um, we did a, 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 um, a coffee hour on online, and it was challenging because a lot of people um, came to Zoom either through a computer with no webcam or through the phone. Yeah. So I did not have the visual to be able to tell who wanted to speak. So there was a little facilitating about that. Yeah. Um, overall, it worked well. People were glad to be hearing one another's voices and, and those that could see each other see each other. So, yeah. But I also facilitated it a bit, like uh, having to guide the process and who would yeah. like to talk about this or that. So. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Bill, can I offer yeah, something? Sure. Um, Sarah, kind of yeah. On a, on a different note, um, I, I saw this, uh, a post on Facebook from my colleague, Cecilia Kingman, who mm -hmm. serves in Seattle. And I just wanted to share some of this with you all um, because I know you're, we're all trying our best to make you know, to keep our, our folks connected. Um, but she says some learnings from Seattle where our situation <clears throat> gets more intense each day. Just when you figure out how to do worship live from your sanctuary with the skeleton crew, it will be time to shift to doing worship from your home. Just when you figure out how to do so many things to replicate church as we know it online, you will realize that what your people need most of all is straight up pastoral care and time to connect with one another, not programming and definitely not perfection. Mm -hmm. Just as you figure out how to minister during a pandemic, the ground shifts and you have to find a new center. I'm realizing quickly that our people don't need us to deliver things we used to deliver every week. They need small group ministry and pastoral care, but the simplest of these things. They don't need curricula. They need to see each other's faces. They don't need polished preaching and music. They need to hear that they are not alone. The most important thing we, do, we can do right now is tend to our own spiritual health, get enough rest. This is going to be a long haul. And that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. This is not just a couple weeks. This is months. Um, and she says, um, you know, there's so much loss. We, we need to do less in order to do what will be necessary all too soon. She has, says, I believe we need to slow way down because if we are already exhausted, we'll have no reserves when the worst of the pandemic arrives. And so I'm sharing this um, because as I said, I mean, we're all doing our best, but just let go of perfection. And, and what we're going to do, at least to start in my congregation, is just to, to use Zoom for small group meetings mm -hmm. um, and, and our, our Sunday services. You know, we're going to use short little videos and put them in, um, in a, an e-blast that people can go to when they need to when they want to but in terms of and and that's whatever you're doing is great but i just i want to say don't don't try to do exactly yeah. what you were doing three weeks ago yeah do what you can do and what people need which is as she's saying simple um yeah. connections yeah thank you thank you for sharing that yes the connections are the most important thing um yeah, and Sarah, if you could send that to me, and then if anybody asks for it, I could maybe send that to them. Um, so if you would like the uh, what Sarah read to us, I'd be happy to send that to you if you send me an email. Um, but yes, the connections are the most important thing. Uh, Zoom is wonderful that we actually can see each other. Um, I love the idea of keeping it simple. And so I was going to say about worship, you know, break it down. What are the just what do you feel like the are the essential elements for worship in your congregation? And just take those basic essential things 
and just, you know, do them for the familiarity uh, so people can say, yes, this is a worship service, but then don't, you know, don't overdo it. Just keep it simple, you know? And so have an opening reading, you know, have some music, have some moments for meditation, have a message, you know, have some closing music, have a benediction, but keep it simple. And don't, you know, don't try to be perfect with it. Um, and especially for small congregations. Um, so um, that, thank you for sharing that. I think that was really worthwhile. Um, let's see here. Yes, uh, Wendy's saying they shorten their online gathering to 20 to 30 minutes, child slider and its announcements, opening words, mission statement, joys and concerns, short harmony. Right, and so joys and concerns, you can do them in the chat box. Um, if you do it in the chat box, you'll want to read them for the people who can't see them because they're on the phone. You can have people, you know, do what we're doing here and, um, you know, just unmute themselves and, and share that way too. Um, you know, people have been asking about break, breakout room, and I really want to um, share this with you is, uh, um, yeah, paring down the, the length of your homily and everything, right? Yes. So I was just reading another comment there. So I'm going to do the breakout rooms. I'm going to do them randomly, and uh, you'll, all, you'll all see what it's like. And um, how about this time, and this is how I imagine maybe an online coffee hour working is kind of like mingling, you know, and you just end up talking with these three other people that you really haven't had a chance to talk to before. Um, so what I'm going to say, um, uh, what I'm going to do is send you over into um, um, some breakout rooms. And what I just, for now, why don't you just introduce yourselves and say where you're from and um, uh, say, I don't know, um, what is the best thing that you've had to eat since you've been kind of isolated in your home? What's the, because I'll tell you right now, my wife and I, they ran out, they got something, but they made some brown butter toffee cookie thing that I haven't tried yet, but I'm going to, but I think it's probably going to be the best thing that I will have eaten at home here in the last week. So how about that, all right? I'll give you like five minutes to do that, all right? So I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms. I'm gonna see what happens. I'm pressing the breakout room button. It says, how many rooms do I want? We've got 50 participants and I want the rooms to be kind of small. So I'm gonna do three to four participant, participants in a room and I'm gonna do it automatically. That's, what it, that's the instructions I got and that's what I was able to do. And I'm gonna create the breakout rooms and now you're going to get something on the screen that says join breakout room number whatever. So go in there, introduce yourselves, let people know what's the best thing you've had to eat since you've been in isolation. And then I will give you a little warning letting you know when we're going to come back out in a minute. Okay? All right. Here they're going to be coming, breakout rooms coming your way, open all rooms. All right. You're being invited to breakout rooms now. That's what you do. There you go. See ya. We're back. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So you ex experienced it. Um, yeah, Deborah had a suggestion that I, I can try, um, which is to do a screen share. Um, and you can see what it's like to set up the breakout rooms. And I guess, you know, I did not know how much we'd have time we'd have to cover today. Um, we've really only done worship and we're just kind of getting into like coffee hour. So I think what we'll do is um, uh, maybe continue next week if people want to, is just keep working with Zoom, if that would be helpful. Um, but, okay. Oh. David sharing a screen. I've been um, screen jacked. Um, let me see. That's interesting. So I'm on here. Yeah. I am, am. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Oh well, that's interesting because I went to a breakout room, but I could hear others. They couldn't hear me, and I there weren't any pictures. There wasn't anything for me to unmute in that hmm. uh, breakout room that I went to. So interesting, interesting. Okay, well, so uh, I'm, I'm a little challenged here. I don't know why my video went off. Yeah, that is interesting because I thought I had done the thing where people weren't supposed to be able to share, 
Um, so gosh, who knows? Maybe we, maybe we, together we have created a new kind of glitch. Woo! Okay, we just got a few minutes left, and I do want to do this for Deborah. She did ask about that. Let's see if I can do this. Just I'm going to lead you. I'm going to get you going on the um, how to do the breakout rooms. Okay. Um, I'm going to close a bunch of stuff right now. I'm going to get to my Zoom. These are all the things we've looked at already. Um, let me see, I've got to stop sharing here. Okay, now let me just see if I can do this. I want to be able to share what you all are seeing right now. Nope. All right. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this right now. That's something we're going to need to maybe um, do later. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, so here's the deal. Um, I'm going to be here next week at the same time, but I scheduled it for a different room. And I want you all to be able to get to that room. So um, we're going we're gonna to promote it and advertise it. And in case you miss that, though, once again, if you would email me, I will send you what that room is, OK? So plund at uua.org. And I'm happy to do this uh, as much as we need to, is just keep exploring Zoom together and see what we can do with it. And uh, you know, we can do that for again next week. Um, if you have questions that I didn't cover here, um, send them to me and that'll help me you know, uh, put together what we will do next week. So I invite all of you to come next week, send me that email and I will send you the new link. And also um, hopefully other people will show up and we'll just keep learning and growing together. Yeah, because what, what else is there to do right now but learn and grow together and stay connected? So it's just so wonderful to see so many people. It's like, ah, oh, people, people. I, yes, I, I want to thank everyone for all the input you have given me. I, I truly appreciate it. And Phil, my hat's off to you. Oh, well, thank you all. I mean, I know you're all trying to do what you can do for your people and for yourselves and your friends. and. You know, I'm glad. I'm so glad religious community is here because that's what we're all about, right? So, okay, y'all. This is Huron. I just wanted to see. Okay, yeah. So my my square light lights up, but for some reason my video isn't there. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. You don't get to see uh, what I look like today. <laughs> okay. All right. Maybe next week. So, all right, everyone. Thank you. So good to see you all, and hopefully I'll see you next week then. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Phil. Bye.